just one minute until we get started. Okay, it's uh, two o'clock, so let's go ahead and uh, get started uh, with our second session. It's my pleasure to introduce the moderator of the session, Kevin Burke. He's the executive vice president of the Illinois Asphalt Pavement Association. And prior to joining IAPA, Burke spent uh, 20 years serving Illinois Department of Transportation in several capacities at the Materials and Physical Research Bureau and Local Roads and Streets. He earned his bachelor from Washington University in St. Louis, and he is a registered professional engineer in Illinois. And he has been doing a great job for our industry here in Illinois. Uh, Kevin, I'll turn it to you as the moderator of the session. Thank you, Dr. al -Qaeda. So. This morning we heard a lot of good talks and more of the broad general overviews um, and this afternoon's session we'll get into a little bit more technical side of a couple of the topics that are trending in the industry and then we'll also talk a little bit about workforce development and the next generation coming into our workforce. So with that I will introduce our first speaker. Um, the topic will be plastics and asphalt pavements. Amit Bashin is a professor, Temple Foundation Endowed Fellow and Director of the Center for Transportation Research at the University of Texas at Austin's Department of Civil, Architectural and Environmental Engineering. He has an active research program in the area of pavements and materials supported by a range of private and public agencies from within and outside of the United States. He is involved in several national and international organizations and committees pertaining to research in the area of payments and, mater and materials. Amit, if you want to go ahead um, and open up your microphone, you've got your presentation up. Kevin, thank you very much for the introduction and Professor Alcaldi and organizers for inviting me to talk at this conference. Before I get started, uh, the screen, are you able to see my PowerPoint? Is it, or do you see two screens or do you see just one screen? We see your two. We see the um, the your speaker notes right now. We don't see okay. the full presentation. Let me try that. How about now? That's perfect. All right. Thank you very much. And uh, once again, thank you to the organizers uh, for inviting me to talk uh, at this conference. And as uh, Kevin introduced the topic, this is something that is trending in the industry quite a bit. Uh, there have been uh, there's been a lot of interest among several DOTs. Uh, even at the national level, and also local municipalities and cities, uh, as best as I'm aware, uh, I've talked to uh, quite a few local governments that are interested in this, this particular idea to promote uh, sustainability and, and benefit the environment. So I'll jump right in. Uh, just to get things started, I talk a little bit about plastics in general and then uh, a little bit about uh, some testing that we have been doing as a part of another project, both in terms of mixture and binder. Uh, what uh, some of the results that I've presented that are included in this presentation, there's not a, not a whole lot, but the, the, some of the results that I've included uh, are from a project that is uh, funded by the Qatar National Research Foundation. Uh, and we're doing this jointly with Texas A&M Qatar. Professor Yer Nasad here is the PI of the project and I'm working with him uh, as a co-PI from here, UT Austin. And Dr. Lakshmi is, uh, is the point of contact on this research project at, at Qatar uh, and, and leading some of the work. Uh, this, this project started about uh, a year, more than a, a little more than a year ago. And uh, Qatar, as you know, is, uh, is one of the largest suppliers of natural gas and therefore plastics is something that is uh, very natural to come from that as a, as a byproduct or as an industrial product. I also, before I get started, I also wanna thank uh, my, uh, my colleagues here and, and researchers at, at UT Austin, particularly uh, they've been working on this project. Uh, it, it's, it's amazing to see how 
uh, resilient they've been over the last few months uh, that everybody is facing. They've been able to come to lab, work in shifts and do what they do. So, and, and including Dr. Ramesh Haj, who is now with the uh, University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, who developed some of the tests that I'll talk about uh, later in my presentation. Uh, so just to get started, I think a good place to start is just generally talk about plastics uh, and, uh, you know, in terms of using plastics in asphalt, we're talking about repurposing asphalt. We're familiar with recycling and we're familiar with reusing, but I think in the context of asphalt mixtures, what we are trying to do here is to repurpose asphalt, uh, plastics and use them in asphalt as an additive or as an extender and so forth. Uh, the natural, so, so the first question I want to talk about is what can and cannot be repurposed in asphalt mixes? What are the kinds of plastics that can and cannot be repurposed? Uh, second, once we know what plastics can be repurposed, where do we find such plastics? And, and also ask the question, I don't have the answer to the third question, but also it's important that we ask the question that should we be repurposing this and using this in asphalt? And, and if we do, then we get into mixture performance and so forth. So, um, what I thought I'd do is based on my conversations uh, in the past with a number of people who are interested in this topic, I thought it'd be a good place to start would be to introduce the types of plastics and, and establish some vocabulary uh, because that helps uh, even if you're going to do a literature review, if you're going to understand uh, how we plan or how we imagine ourselves using asphalt in, uh, I'm sorry, using plastics in asphalt mixes. Uh, establishing that vocabulary or, or the basics in plastics is very important uh, precursor to that. So I thought I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that and I apologize in advance if this is um, a little bit uh, too trivial for some of the folks involved uh, or some of the listeners. But uh, here we are, so just in terms of global perspective, uh, if you look at the plastic production, uh, if you look at from 1950, this data was last compiled uh, in 2017 and dates back to 2015, but you can see the trajectory, uh, the upward trajectory of plastic uh, production. And we are close to, we are over 350 million tons of plastic as we stand today. And where it goes in terms of consumption, if you look at the last, uh, you know, 25 year, the 35 year window shown in this graphic, and now 40 year window, uh, you'll see that we went from no, re like, no recycling whatsoever. Everything was being discarded to a point where now there are two, other than being discarded, there are two primary, two other purposes with which uh, plastics are used. One would be the recycling of plastics and second is incineration of plastics. The incineration category is interesting because you actually decompose plastics in the process, you generate heat and you're literally using this uh, to produce energy as you go along. And there are clearly some advantages, disadvantages uh, to this process. Uh, but then on the top, you see recycled. Uh, even with the recycling and incineration, uh, we're still over 50% of plastic today is being discarded. And if you compare to the previous graphic, and although it seems like, you know, the last 35 years, we have now coming close to 50%, only 50% uh, discarding plastics in landfill, that seems like a, like a good growth. But if you look at the statistic over here and you compare the numbers, uh, even at 50%, we are now, because we are growing faster than ever in terms of our production and consumption of plastic, even that 50%, if you take ton for ton, it's actually not, this graphic would not reduce, it would actually grow if you plot it in terms of the tonnage of plastics. So this is clearly an area of, of great concern in terms of the environment globally, and we as, as the asphalt industry would like to see what we can do about this. So. Uh, before we get started, I think it's important to establish the vocabulary. Like I said, I apologize if this is a little bit trivial for some of the folks, but it's important to, to establish the vocabulary and identify what can and cannot or should or should not be used in asphalt mixes. So let's start with the Society for Plastics uh, Industry classification or SPI classification. This is perhaps the most common classification. If you pick up any piece of plastic uh, around you, chances are you will find this classification printed on it or embossed on the piece of plastic. And there are seven classifications here. The top six are really materials and the seventh is another catch-all kind of category where if nothing else fits, it, it goes there or in terms of plastics that are complicated or complex. Of these, we ought to start off with these three, the PVC, polystyrene and others. These three 
are, are, are clearly the kinds of plastics that uh, are referred to as plastics, but they cannot normally be used uh, for paving applications or, or repurposed for uh, asphalt mixers. And the reason for that are multiple PVC, when you heat it to the temperatures at which hot mix asphalt is produced, uh, it releases uh, toxic gases. So that's, that there's a great deal of health and environmental concern around it. Uh, polystyrene, the melting point of polystyrene is above 200 degrees Celsius, and it has a very low density handling, collecting, reusing. There are a lot of logistical issues in capturing polystyrene and incorporating it in asphalt mixes. And even if we do, like I said, the, the specific gravity of polystyrene is very low uh, because it's, it's foam material. It's intended to be an insulator and most of the uses as an insulator. So it, it has a very low density. So handling and this material along with the typical materials that we use in asphalt mixes, very difficult. The catch-all category, other, again, we don't know what it is. So it's very difficult to control and repurpose it in asphalt mixes. We may be dealing with toxic materials or we may be dealing with combination of different materials. So it's very difficult to capture the supply stream on this other category and use it. So right off the bat, you say that out of these seven categories, three are, are not really viable for use in asphalt mixes. And let's walk down the rest. The top one, as you've seen, this is perhaps the most common one that we have seen around us is uh, polyethylene tetraethylate or PET. Uh, and this is, you see plastic bottles, uh, PET plastic bottles, and, and you can see the recycling logo over there. Uh, is it widely collected? This is in municipal waste supply streams. This is perhaps the most widely collected plastic. Uh, it can be recycled. Uh, can it be repurposed in asphalt? Very likely it can be used in asphalt. Uh, and should it be used in asphalt? I leave that as a question mark because if you've captured the material and if you have been able to separate it at that point, the question really becomes one of value. Does it add more value as a paving material or does it add more value if it were to be recycled and reused as another PET bottle? So unless there are policy directives, uh, this becomes an economic question, a question of value addition uh, is, it, is it more valuable to make another plastic bottle out of this or is it more valuable to add it in an asphalt mix? So should we use it in asphalt? Again, this is, I don't have the answer to this. This becomes a very uh, value-driven economics-based question. Uh, HDPE, milk, milk bottles, shampoo bottles, this is also, uh, these are also widely collected. Even some plastic bags, uh, some plastic bags are LDPE, but some plastic bags, this is a bag from Walmart, uh, you can see that it has uh, uh, the, the two logo and clearly says, it's not very clearly, but you can read it says HDPE right over there. So some plastic bags are HDPE. Are these widely collected? Uh, bottles, yes. Plastic bags, no. Because again, depending on the municipal streams, many municipal waste collectors do not allow this kind of plastic to be collected. Can it be recycled? Yes. Can it be repurposed in asphalt? Very likely uh, it can be. And uh, should it be used, again, that's another question of economics right over there, that if you've captured this, should you, should or should you, shouldn't you use this? Uh, LDPE, this is uh, uh, low density polyethylene. Low density polyethylene is, is widely collected. Chances are not because many municipal waste recycling streams do not collect this. Uh, in fact, even if they collect it, they may, they may sort it out, uh, or even if you accidentally throw it, they may remove it. Uh, and, and the only supply streams for this kind of plastic is where you go to a grocery store and they say, yeah, you know, recycle your bags here or something of that kind. The reason for that is very practical. Most of the time, this LDPE, these very lightweight plastic, these kind of bags uh, are very difficult to handle in the waste supply streams and you're, when you're trying to sort it. Uh, shred it, uh, the machinery, uh, it, it jams the machinery and so forth. So it's a very practical problem. Uh, most municipal waste recycling streams do not allow this. Is it recyclable? Yes, definitely. It is recyclable and it can be repurposed. In fact, the results that I'm about to show are based on LDPE. Uh, should it be used in asphalt? Uh, very likely, yes, I think, because there is very little economic value in LDPE once, uh, you know, once it's been produced. Uh, so it, it is a very good candidate for being used in asphalt mixes. The challenge though, is that although it's a good candidate, it's a great candidate, uh, it is difficult to collect because most municipal supply streams do not at the moment collect these plastic bags. There's, 
the, the kind of volumes we're talking about, if you're trying to access that large volume of waste plastic in a, in a, in a waste stream, uh, that would be very difficult to get hold of. So there's a, there's a logistical issue over there. This is a good candidate because uh, it, it can be recycled, but it has better value perhaps being used in an, or repurposed in an asphalt mix. Uh, but collecting these supply streams is a challenge. Polypropylene, uh, is it widely collected? Again, the answer depends, not very widely collected because the ability to recycle polypropylene uh, is it's only come into place in the last year or two years that uh, plastics industries have developed methods to recycle polypropylene. So this might change in time uh, from where we stand right now. Is it recyclable? I, I put a caution mark over there because uh, like I said, this is just uh, within the last one or two years, there've been technologies developed to recycle polypropylene. Um, there have been issues with recycling. Uh, usually these things are used for food containers and it is a very, it, it, it has a tendency to absorb or absorb uh, odors and things like that. So even after you recycle it, sometimes some of those effects do not go away. And, and, and that was one of the inhibitors for recycling it. But in the last one or two years, uh, there, there are companies that have developed technologies to recycle it. So this may change. This is and again, one of those, candidates that can very likely be repurposed in asphalt uh, and perhaps should be used in, in asphalt. But again, we have a supply stream issue that is very likely to change in the, in the days to come. Uh, just to capture or summarize what I just said, uh, LDPE polypropylene based on their uh, value after recycling are probably good candidates that should be repurposed in asphalt mixes. But the, the challenge there is the supply streams for these materials are not well established. That, that doesn't mean it's not gonna change. These things are changing uh, on, a, on a daily basis. So we may have more of that in the future. PET, HDPE, again, uh, good candidates. Uh, they have better well-established supply streams, but that also means that they have a system in place for recycling this. So they may provide more economic value by being recycled and not repurposed. So that's again, something uh, that it's a complex question, right? Unless there's there's a demand for a particular product, you will not have that product being generated in the supply side and, and vice versa. One other interesting thing that I wanna point out here is that if you look at the melting point of these four plastics, uh, PET uh, goes is the highest, which is about 260 degrees Celsius. The others are 120 to 160 degrees Celsius, which makes it, uh, that in terms of mixing it or repurposing this with asphalt mixes, uh, PET is a better candidate for a dry mix, meaning uh, I'm using the, the same vocabulary or terminology that is used with asphalt rubber uh, in that dry mix is something that is added during mixture production and wet mix is something that is added to the binder. It becomes a part of the binder matrix and then that binder is used uh, with aggregates to produce a mix. So a dry mix, uh, if you look at PET, uh, that is a better candidate for a dry mix because the melting point is so high. Uh, and when it comes to other plastics, HDP, LDP, and polypropylene, uh, these you could add it during mixture production in a dry process or uh, because the temperatures are within the range of mixing with asphalt binder, you could blend them with the asphalt binder. And, and blending of the wet process also gives you the advantage that you could use compatibilizers and other agents. Um, another thing to keep in mind is the decomposition temperature. Most plastics, uh, again, there is no one HDPE. HDPE is just a family of plastics. LDP is also a family of plastics and so forth. But generally speaking, if you look at the decomposition temperature, that's the temperature above which these plastics start to degrade, uh, you'll notice that they are in the range of about 260 to 300, 400 degrees Celsius. So this is good because these two temperatures tell us the, the viability, just, just walking in and the viability of using these four categories of plastics with asphalt mixtures. And the others we have excluded uh, for reasons that I've discussed before. Now let's get into a little bit of uh, test results from some of our testing that we have done in the recent past. Uh, just, a, just a small window into performance related to mixture and binder properties. Uh, there's a lot that has been done uh, particularly in Asia on recycling plastic and asphalt mixes. And my, my colleague uh, on this project, uh, Professor Masadis uh, and his co-workers have put a nice uh, 
review of all of this. I provided a link for you to download that review. It's tinyurl.com, tinyurl.com uh, slash uh, plastic and asphalt, just one word, plastic and asphalt, and you can find, it'll take you to the website where you can download this uh, uh, literature review on, on plastics and asphalt mixers. But for the remainder of the 10, 12 minutes I have, I will go into the, the some example results of, of using uh, of mixture and binder performance based on our lab tests. Uh, so in terms of mixture performance, uh, the materials that we used was, uh, was an LDPE. And as I uh, mentioned earlier, the four viable candidates are LDPE, HDPE, uh, uh, PET, and uh, uh, I forget, sorry, uh, PP, sorry, LDPE, HDPE, PET, and, and, and polypropylene. We started with LDPE because it is perhaps the uh, uh, easiest and most viable candidate in terms of mixing with asphalt uh, binders. Uh, the process, so we have two mixes here. Uh, the Q and T represent two different binder sources. Actually, they stand for Qatar and, and Texas because we got one binder from each place. And then uh, we had these controls mixed with LDPE 70. 3% uh, by weight of the binder. We used a wet process. Again, we were looking at the best case scenario here. We measured different mixture properties like complex, modulus, Hamburg, uh, uh, you know, IDT strength or ideal CT index and the flexibility index and so forth. The results are fairly straightforward. I'll go through them uh, very quickly so that we have some time for questions at the end. Uh, complex modulus, the typical standard uh, TP32 uh, is, uh, is five temperatures, five frequencies. Uh, these are the master curves. You can see the, the solid lines are the controls. The dashed lines are the LDPE. This is on a log scale. So maybe this is a better picture to look at if you look at the percentage change with respect to the control. Uh, so this is just a master curve, but not the master curve itself, but percentage change in the master curve. So if you see both the Qatar and Texas binder showed similar, somewhat similar trends that LDP sort of had uh, at around 10 hertz in that master curve, or sorry, 10 seconds in that master curve, which corresponds to a, a slow rate of loading or, and or uh, somewhat high temperature side, uh, intermediate to high temperature side. So if you look at that, you'll notice that the, the sort of the change in stiffness also is not uniform, but you see the, the, the highest effect of that change in stiffness, it's somewhere around this intermediate to high temperatures or uh, moderate to high loading times. And, and then it drops off to, to no change. This makes sense because if you have extensive, very long loading times and are very high temperatures, at that point, the material is not contributing much. The binder, the, the, the soft nature of the binder will dictate the overall uh, mixture performance and the aggregate matrix. Uh, Hamburg, uh, you see the same thing, uh, some improvement in rutting resistance uh, keeping in mind that the Hamburg test is done at high temperatures. So if you're looking back at this curve, you're somewhere somewhere in this region where these effects are sort of tapering off. But, but despite that, uh, you see some improvement in the rutting resistance as you add these plastics. So that's a good thing. It's, it's good for rutting, uh, shows this uh, effect on two different asphalt binder systems. Uh, the indirect tensile strength test, um, again, this is the, the standard test, except that we are also measuring displacement. And, and the ideal CT index and so forth, without getting into the details of the index, the two things to look here would be uh, the strength and ductility. So if you look at the, the, the tensile strength of the material, that certainly increases. And if you look at the ductility, there is, uh, although this in this particular binder, it looks like the ductility has increased, that increases really small, uh, but there's also a loss in the slope. So meaning it becomes more, a little bit, loses a little bit of ductility, but it gains a little bit of strength here. And if you look at the other mix, also the same behavior, you can see an increase in strength, a little bit loss in ductility. Uh, we did the same thing with uh, the SCB flexibility index. Um, and and you, would, you would see the same kind of result. Uh, you see an increase in strength. Uh, a little bit loss in ductility, increase in strength, a little bit loss in ductility. So this is consistent uh, <clears throat> across the two binders, across uh, these two different uh, uh, tests and so forth. So uh, you're beginning to see this pattern here that uh, there is a little bit of compromise when you're using these plastics. 
And going into a smaller lens scale, looking at binder properties, uh, we also did this, uh, except that in this case, uh, we, we had the, the Q and T, the two different binders and the two different binders with LDPE. But we added two more binders here. This was the plus E shows plus alloy. Uh, we, we worked with uh, a little bit with Dow Chemical uh, on this and uh, their terpolymer that they use also is, um, is intended to be a compatibilizing agent to, that stops the separation of plastic and helps distribute the plastic in the asphalt binder a little bit, little bit better. So uh, Dow Chemical was uh, kind enough to help us with uh, some of the materials, the alveoloy. Uh, they had some of their technical staff also work with us in our lab. And we produce these blenders, blends uh, with, uh, with, with alveoloy and the plastic. All of this again, as before, was wet process. And we'll look at a few things. We looked at dispersion, PG grade, uh, the, the, the GNR and cohesion and so forth. So in terms of disc dispersion, you can see these are the two control binders. This is uh, fluorescence microscopy, uh, the two control binders. And once you add plastic, you will see that uh, in both cases, you can see that the plastic uh, disperses, but it does not fully blend and does not become a homogeneous part of the asphalt binder. And all, all of this was done using uh, a high shear blender. So uh, even in that case, you would see small uh, particulate, uh, particulate additives left behind. So you can see how the polymer, uh, how the plastic LDPE is being dispersed. Now, this is also interesting that when we add the ter polymer, uh, you would see that that dispersion actually, that ter polymer helps disperse some of that plastic even better. So you see a significant improvement in the dispersion as you go from the images in the middle to the images on the right, you would see that the particle size on, the, on an average, the particle size is reduced. Uh, it's much more uniform. It's, it's not a fully smooth blend yet, but it has significantly improved in dispersion. And it's always better to have smaller, finer, more dispersed particles instead of larger blobs uh, accumulating. So in that sense, that third polymer uh, did, did clearly show visually uh, some benefits here. Uh, some of the standard tests like the PG, uh, you would see that, you know, whether you take the unaced or RTFOAs, the high temperature grade, you see the same stiffness increase that we saw in asphalt mixtures, whether it was the, the Qatar binder or the Texas binder, uh, this is very consistent, the increase in stiffness. Corresponding to that, if you look at the low temperature properties, uh, this is a low temperature grade uh, stiffness measurement using the, uh, uh, using the BBR. And if you look at the S value, uh, it, it reduces, but, but not a whole lot. It's not, not very significant uh, for both binders. What is significant is, is the loss in M value. It does lose M value. Again, you, you'd see that it's almost by, by one grade over there. But uh, adding the ter polymer pulls that M value back a little bit. So, so you, that some of that loss is recovered and you see that consistently across both binders. Uh, in that you have uh, a loss in the M value and some of that uh, very slightly is offset by adding the polymer. MSER, the same thing, you see stiffness increase, stiffness increase uh, and elastic recovery. Really none of these materials showed any elastic recovery. The only, the reason why you see an elastic recovery here is because the, and we added an elastomer, the tar polymer uh, to the mix and the elastic recovery that you see from this comes from that polymer. Uh, cohesion and tensile, this is something we added because uh, to us while studying plastics was interesting and, and that was the main goal. As a side goal, we were also, uh, or a, a, another objective was to look at the tests itself. Over the years, um, I've seen several, what I call as band-aids to the PG specification. There's polyphosphoric acid that was, everybody was talking about polyphosphoric acid a few years ago in the industry. And so they came about tests on how to exclude PPA, how to ensure there's no PPA because it was not good, it was bad. The binder producers argued that to some extent PPA has always been added in asphalt binders. It was never an issue unless you exceed a certain limit and so on and so forth. We saw the same thing with REOB. We're now having similar discussions about Delta T sub C and so forth. Now, to keep in mind that all of these band-aids were introduced because the performance specification was not picking on performance. We should not have to have a separate test every time there is a new additive or every time there's a new technology. 
if we are measuring binder performance and a true performance indicator, then it should be transparent to whatever is added to the formulation if it is really a true performance indicator. And that was sort of the motivation where we went into this cohesion and tensile test, uh, which is not an industry standard, but we developed it over the years uh, to, to as, a, as a binder test that tracks mixture properties uh, that's easy to run in the lab. This was the original version of that test, a very small, uh, we call it, we also call it the poker chip test because it's a very small, thin film of the asphalt binder between rigid plates. Um, also keeping in mind that the asphalt binder in an asphalt mix never exists like a thick blob that, blob that you see in a DSR specimen. It's always confined. And the properties of an adhesive that is confined are very different from properties of an adhesive that is unconfined or in the bulk. Uh, you cannot take a tank of, of glue in the bulk and expect it to have the same properties when you confine it in a thin film. It's, it's a very, very different behavior. So in any case, uh, we have this test that actually is very sensitive to the chemical. This picture just shows the sensitivity of this method to pick up cavitation and failure and, and strength ductility for different chemistries of asphalt binder. In a more recent incarnation of this test, we made it very user friendly where you could run multiple tests on a typical Instron machine at 25 degrees Celsius. And we, we, we use this with our asphalt binders. And, and what you see here are the control uh, and uh, the plastic modified asphalt binder. Again, <clears throat> just as with the mixture results, you see the same thing with plastics. You see an increase in tensile strength. This is what you saw in two different mixture tests earlier and a little bit loss in ductility, which is what you're seeing here. So this is consistent to the previous test. What we did not do in mixtures that we did with asphalt binders was also to add the elastomer. And you can see the elastomer now helps bring back some of that ductility uh, with particularly this particular binder. And you'll see it's the same trend with the next binder. Again, the bottom line is control. The top one is with the plastic, increase in tensile strength, decrease in ductility, and you add the tert polymer, it, it brings it back. And there are other interesting things we can do with this. Uh, you know, we can look at this uh, microstructure, phase distribution. You could look at the failure surfaces from this poker chip test, and you'd see how the failure surface, crack propagation, and all that happens. Uh, this, I mean, this is not the time or venue to discuss this, but just as a side note, this, there's a lot more we can get out of this uh, method. Anyway, so just to recap, I think as we think about plastics in asphalt, uh, and we're talking about repurposing plastics, we have to think about what is available, what is available today and what are the technologies being developed in the, in the municipal waste supply streams and so forth. How can we get access to those plastics? Uh, what can be repurposed and what should be repurposed. Uh, not everything can be repurposed and not everything should be repurposed because of economic considerations. And typically with our preliminary results with LDP, what we see is uh, an increase in stiffness, increase in rutting resistance, increase in tensile strength, but it comes at a cost of a little bit of loss of ductility, whether this is, uh, you know, the, whether to the two offset each other for a zero or net gain in performance that, uh, that we can run a few more fatigue tests to establish better. Um, and, and that's, that was the last point is that we're, we're in the middle of this project and we hope to get uh, more results in time. Uh, with that, I will, I think I'm right on time here or maybe a little bit, a few a minute over. We'll thank our sponsors, the Qatar National Research Foundation, Techstart, uh, a couple of projects with Techstart to help us and the Ergon Fellowship Program. I think we have time for at least one question. Are there any questions? Noel, do you know who's moderating questions or I do not see any? Well, I do have a question. Hello. Go ahead. Professor Bashim. Yeah, this is Javier Garcia from UEC. I would like to know for the two binders that you were showing results for, what was the methodology to add the plastics to them? What RPM did you use for how much time? What temperature? Uh, if you send me a, a, a note, I can send you those details. The, the, the temperature was obviously very high. It was a heating mantle. I have all those parameters. So I can send you those details. OK, perfect. And then I, I do see you. I also have a question, if nobody else has. 
Yeah, we've got one other question that is up in the um, chat box, and it's um, from Don Rosenbarger from Delta Companies. What is the available percentage of plastics to be recycled? Um, so, I, Don, I'm not sure if you mean the available percentage of, of plastics currently available or if you are talking about the actual percent of plastics that is being put into the mix. So maybe you can answer both of those. So in, in terms of adding to the mix, uh, two to four percent by weight of binder seems to be something that can typically be absorbed based on the studies that we have done. Now, now there are this is this, this is applicable for HDPE, LDPE, and and poly uh, polypropylene. Poly PET, uh, on the other hand, can because of its high melting point can also be added to substitute as for the lack of a better word is aggregate. So you can, you can see, you see, you see some of these plastics, waste plastics that are shredded and added to the asphalt mix that will not fully mix and blend and won't become a part of the binder matrix, but will just, there'll be little chips and residue there. So those can perhaps go at a slightly higher percentage, but plastics that tend to blend and become incorporated in the matrix, uh, those typically based on the work uh, we're doing and based on the work, a, a, a large volume of literature that is out there, is, is two to four percent is is sort of uh, the the safe spot uh, in terms of performance. I think Dow Chemical with Elvoli they have a study in NCAT where they use, if I'm not mistaken, something similar in the same order of magnitude. Uh, what is the person of plastics globally? Uh, I could just go back to ah, how many tons will our industry? Uh, not nearly enough. <laughs> I think I've done the math on the back of the envelope somewhere over there, uh, because uh, in, in Texas, about we, we, we're somewhere between 12 to 15 million metric tons. So if every single, of, uh, that's a good question. I honestly, I did this math somewhere at the back of an envelope, uh, trying to figure out if we consumed, if we added 2% plastic flat out in every mix, every ton for ton, every mix that we ever produced, would be, how much dent would we make it, uh, in the environment? Uh, the answer is, uh, it, it, it's a small dent, but it's still significant. Right. And I think we're, I think we're kind of short on time right now. Um, so in order to give the, the remaining speakers an opportunity to, to get their presentations done and um, get questions answered, we'll go ahead and um, document all these questions. And I believe Lama is going to be, be reviewing them and um, we will try to get all those questions answered after this session is over, if that's possible. Yes, Amad, sure. Is that how you're, you're handling the question? Yes, absolutely. Lama will, will compile these questions and uh, we'll send them to, to Amit. And thank you so much, Amit. <laughs> Amit, thank you. thank you very thank much. You. Very, very informative. And um, like I said, this is definitely a hot topic and we look forward to, to working with the, the researchers as this moves forward to see how and if it is something that we can use in our asphalt pavements here in Illinois. All right, thank you all once again. Uh, and this leads us into our next topic and a real good transition. And the Illinois Department of Transportation is currently conducting research um, looking at the rheological and chemical based procedure to evaluate additives and modifiers used in asphalt binders for performance enhancement. Kelly Morris is the chief chemist for IDOT Central Bureau of Materials. Um, prior to that, she worked as the analytical chemistry lab supervisor in the analytical chemistry lab at IDOT's Bureau of Materials and Physical Research. Kelly received her bachelor's degree in chemistry from Illinois Wesleyan University. And Kelly, if you are ready, we will get you up and running and she will give you an update on this research project. We're seeing your presentation. You may be muted. We're not hearing you talk right now, Kelly. Can you hear me now? We can. <laughs> Great, thank you, Kevin, for the introduction. Good afternoon. I appreciate the opportunity to share the work uh, completed to date on the uh, developing of a modified bonder qualification protocol um, for the Illinois Department of Transportation. <laughs> Technical difficulties, bear with me here for a series of questions. There we go. 
The Illinois specifications do not currently allow asphalt binder modification with anything other than polymer. IDOT is now considering allowing other modifiers due to the observed shift of the base binders, um, as Jim showed earlier in a graphic, from PG64-22 to the softer grades PG58-28. These softer grades are being used to adapt to the higher levels of recycled asphalt content in our HMA. The need to change became increasingly evident in these recent years. Our industry partners have highlighted the variability of the current crude sources and the overall difficulty they have in achieving the softer base grades without the use of modification. While the arguments were persuasive, little was known on the various modifiers, so Illinois felt it was important to evaluate the modifiers and the modified binders to verify that the softer grades can in fact be achieved without compromising quality. The following pro project summary is IDOT's strategy to find that protocol for evaluating and qualifying modifiers to find an economic and sustainable alternative and achieve those softer asphalt binders. IDOT is working with the University of Illinois, Illinois Center for Transportation to perform an extensive research project titled Rheology Chemical-Based Procedure to Evaluate Additives, Modifiers Used in Asphalt Binders for Performance Enhancement. The PIs on this project are Dr. Sharma, Dr. Ozer, and Dr. Alkadi. While I am the spokesperson today for this project, it is the hard work of the PIs and their dedicated team that really should be acknowledged and appreciated. The work done in this project is truly unique and groundbreaking and will help lead to a fully implementable binder modification qualification protocol at IDOT. The goals of the research were broken down into four primary categories. We had binder chemistry, long-term aging, modifier chemistry, and a validation procedure. The binder chemistry observes the effects of modifiers on the binder chemistry and performance. The objective of the long-term aging is to develop an efficient long-term laboratory aging procedure for modified binders. In other words, determine how much and what type of aging best characterizes and distinguishes the performance of the various modified binders. The modifiers were chemically characterized through a variety of analytical chemistry techniques. And finally, this work was validated and fine-tuned with field cores and multiple analysis techniques to ensure that the performance of the modified binders was adequately evaluated. This next slide summarizes the research approach. The rheology work was performed via dynamic shear rheometry, frequency sweep, bending beam, and linear amplitude sweep. The chemical analysis was performed through Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy, gel permeation chromatography, thin layer chromatography, flame ionized detection, saturate, aromatic, resin, and asphaltine analysis, microscopy, thermal gravimetric analysis, and differential scanning calorimetry. Once the rheology and chemistry were determined on the base binders, modified binders, and the modifiers themselves, aging parameters were then applied and the modified binders tested again using that same protocol. It is understood that asphalt binder deteriorates and is accelerated by aging. It is important to understand how the modifiers will affect the aging of the asphalt binder. In order to validate the lab methodology, lab aging methodology, field cores have been collected and the binder extracted to determine, to determine how much the field age binders compare to the lab age binders. As you can see by this slide, we had a very ambitious experimental plan. There were 12 modifiers and eight binders that were made up, um, that made up the initial matrix. S4 binder was removed from this study because it did not conform to a PG 58 minus 28. Binder S8 is a binder that was used in the field test section by IDOT and was modified with modifier L. As you can see on the slide, we also give the generic chemical makeup of it. We have kept this study blind to product names, we're just looking at the generic chemistry and trying to evaluate them on basic classes of materials. The S number represents the grade of the base binder and the source of that binder. The alphabetic designation signifies each unique modifier 
and the numeric designation is the dosage of the modifier used to achieve the target binder. The initial work was performed on binder S1. The modifiers chosen for the initial phase were A, C, D, E, G, and K. And they, were mod they modified the base 64 minus 22 to a softer 58 minus 28. The bulk of the rheology work has been performed on the base and reference binders, as well as the modified binders that were modified at the dosages recommended by the modifier suppliers. Rheological work to determine the optimal dosage, source variability, and softer PG, such as 52 minus 34, will be continued in 2021. This project, as was mentioned earlier, is, has been granted an extension due to some of the lab closures in response to COVID-19. This next graph demonstrates the super paved PG grading of each of the modifiers of binder S1. The dosages were based on the modifier supplier's doses and the grading concentrated in the upper right triangle. As you can see, REOB modifier K failed to achieve a 58 minus 28 with binder S1. Additional dosages will be selected to populate the lower left triangle. And this again will be done as part of the work to optimize and verify the modif modifier dosages in 2021. Next, I'm gonna briefly go through some of the rheological work and give a brief summary of each of um, the primary um, tests that were done and how those um, correlations are gonna be used by Illinois. Bending beam, or WTC, and dynamic shear Glover row were the small strain low temperature parameters evaluated. These tests indicate the binder's low temperature performance. Bending beam is related to relaxation, and Glover row is related to the ductility. Ductility and creep loading, relaxation, are related to distresses caused by negative temperatures, not loading. National research projects have indicated that Delta TC is a parameter that has promise in the prediction of modifier binders long-term performance. Delta TC serves to quantify the non-loading cracking behavior of H binder that is affected by the asphalt binders diminished relaxation property. The lower the Delta TC, the more susceptible the binder is to low temperature cracking. The graphs on the slide from left to right increase PAV aging. S1 is the unmodified PG64 minus 22 binder, and S5 is a PG58 minus 28 without modification. Those two are used as kind of a baseline and a metric for you to be able to compare the modified binder um, of each of the various grades. If you recall again, the um, K or the brown on the graphic is REOB. The H is a petroleum-based modifier. The green are vegetable oil-based modifiers. The yellow are fatty acids. The G blue is glycolamine. And then you see the, the base binders and then the binder that was modified in the field as S9. As you move across the graph, you notice that all of the Delta C, TC were improved with the modification except for K. The glycolamine and fatty acid derivatives perform better using the Delta CC criteria than oil-based modifiers. K again was the worst performer and was typically as a general rule included in this project to ensure that we would capture the performance of REOB, something that is known in Illinois as not a successful um, modifier for our binders. If you notice the trends were more comparable for two and three PAV aging, that the aging at a single PAV does not necessarily capture the differentiation of the different modifiers um, adequately. The red line on the graphic of PAV and 2PAV are the Asphalt Institute's um, current recommended criteria for minus two delta TC for um, single PAV aging and minus five for uh, 2PAV. Asphalt Institute has not given a criteria for three PAV aging because 
during their study that uh, developed these criteria, they did not age to 3PAV. Since the calculation for delta TC is the difference between the critical temperature of the creep stiffness minus the critical temperature of the creep rate, the sign on the delta TC, whether positive or negative, is determined by the creep stiffness, a positive delta TC, or by creep rate, minus delta TC. As you can see by this graphic, after aging, the M value was most affected by aging, and thus more negative delta TC values were seen after aging. The Glover row parameter is considered a useful parameter for describing cracking in many asphalt pavements, particularly for issues that are associated with durability and non-load associated cracking. As you can see by the graphics on the right-hand side of the slide, you go on the top is single PAV, 2 PAV, and 3 PAV if you go down the slide. If you notice the scale, the scale is increasing and the Glover row values are increasing with aging. The glycolamine and fatty acid derivatives show lower general Glover row values over vegetable oil-based modifiers. Those vegetable oil clusters all together, typically on all of the rheological properties, we saw a very consistent trend with all of the different vegetable oil-based modifiers. The REOB shows the highest Glover row in all aging conditions. And again, those PAV conditions yield comparable trends as we saw, as you can see by the graphics. So I just described the bending beam uh, delta TC and the Glover row parameter. As you can tell by these um, two graphs, the two criteria characterize the performance of the modifiers, uh, the bonafide binder similarly and provide the same general trends. So what we're saying is these two tests are the small strain and give you relatively similar characteristics and performance values of the modified binder. The frequency sweep testing provides the small strain parameters that relate more closely to vehicle loading and are tested at intermediate temperatures. The crossover parameters provide the viscoelastic transition temperature. And as you can see, the, the increase with aging. And the master curve is um, shown on the right-hand side of the, the graph here of the slide, and it shows the G star um, at 8.9 millipascals, and that is used to characterize the black angle. And you can see those decrease with aging. The phase angle of 8.9 was chosen because it relates to the new proposal to AASHTO to increase the G star sign delta limit to 6,000 kilopascals in the AASHTO M320 and M332 specification for binders having a phase angle of 42 degrees or higher. This phase angle was shown to correctly rank samples based on their ability to relax stresses and is insensitive to the grade of asphalt being tested. Furthermore, the phase angle is a highly reliable measurement with a much lower variability than G star sine delta and can be determined easily, how, <laughs> from existing data. The phase angle also correlates well to delta TC and confirms the relationship between phase angle and relaxation. The phase angle was also found to have a reasonable correlation to the viscosity ratio, indicating the applicability of phase angle to be used in the prediction of oxidative aging. It was the predictive nature related to oxidation that holds merit to this project. And as you can see by the graphs, as the samples are aged, there are distinct trends emerging. Specifically, the glycolamine and fatty acid derivatives, they retain more viscous part than elastic, elastic as compared to those vegetable oil modifiers. Rehab again performed the worst, and the phase angle for vegetable oils are all similar in range. The results of all PAV conditions are comparable, except for H at 2 PAV. There's a little more inconsistency, and I think um, those were retested and, uh, and shown a little more consistent trend with retesting. Next, I'm gonna go through the linear amplitude sweep test. It is a binder performance test that measures fatigue properties of an asphalt binder. LAS uses viscoelastic continuum, da continuum damage mechanics theory to determine the damage intensity to calculate cycles to failure. This was done at um, 
eight millimeter diameter, two millimeter gap. The temperature was for the 58 minus 28 was negative 19. 64 minus 22 was done at negative 25. Frequency of 10 Hertz and the strain level from 0.1 to 30% in 30 seconds. Challenges were faced when running the linear amplitude sweep and interpreting the data due to the post test failure planes was challenging. There was a mixed effect with the accumulated energy until failure. That is, the stiffness plays a role in shortening the test because more energy per cycle is applied to the samples and results in an unreliable trend and poor data post peak. The stress versus strain curves generated demonstrated distinct trends as the material ages. Researchers felt that the, the researchers felt that the curves could be used to characterize the performance of the modified binders if the data was analyzed in a unique manner and avoided those post peak issues. The researchers developed a new parameter, delta G. This parameter uses the data until peak stress. It avoids the 3D stresses, stresses shown in the previous slides and notes that the peak stress is an evident response phenomenon. The state of the sample is used as an indicator, but its endurance is not the sole factor. Delta G is not highly influenced by stiffness and does not involve convoluted post-processing. The higher the resultant delta G, the better the performance of the modified binder. So some of the findings that were enabled by the, the new criteria of delta G is that you could optimize optimum properties at post-PAV aging conditions. You could adequately um, define the effect of aging. As you can see by the graph on the right-hand side of the slide, You've got the unaged binder, you've got the RTFO aged binder, single PAV, double PAV, and three PAV. We saw consistent results that distinguished the modifiers and with the aging. At the very bottom, you can see the effect of the modification at two PAV and the delta G um, percentages. So some of that ranking that we saw before, these are grouped a little bit differently, but you can still see um, the base binder S1 and the binder of the 58 minus 28 without modification, its results as compared to the modifiers. And then the very right bottom, you can see this is modifier F and base binder S1, and you can see the, the curve goes down with aging. So the delta G goes down as you age those materials. Those trends were seen across the board for all of the different modifiers in this project. Brief summary, modifier K, REOB could not be modified to a 58 minus 28 with binder S1. More work will probably be done with that one, but it, it again was used to ensure that it was consistently found um, to poor perform because we know that in the field in Illinois that REOB is not a successful modifier for us. That was in, in fact the case through all the tests that were performed. The modification of S1 improved in Delta CC for all of the modifiers except K. Glycolamine and fatty acid based modifiers demonstrate better cracking resistance characteristics compared to vegetable oil based modifiers. And small strain parameters such as flexural sweep and delta TC are promising indicators for rheological performance and correlate very well. Delta TC trends for the modified binders are mostly consistent with aging, especially once you get into the two and three PAV aging. Again, as the graphic showed before, the M value is the governing factor determining the grade with long-term aging after single PAV. Continuing, the large strain parameters um, are indicators of different characteristics than the small strain. The linear amplitude sweep and the proposed delta G shows excellent promise. It provides a consistent trend with aging and known binder data from small strain tests. This parameter was able to distinguish some performance differences that the small strain parameters did not. Next, I will read briefly the chemical tests that show promise for the iodite bonder modification protocol. All the chemical analysis techniques were mentioned, were completed, um, but this project I wanted to focus in this presentation on the ones that are, show the most uh, 
promise for implementation in Illinois. The first one is the FTIR. It provides a unique fingerprint for each of the modifiers and modified binders. The vegetable oil-based modifier showed similar spectra for all of the different modifiers that fell in that class. The fatty acids lacked the alkoxy group and REAB lacked the carbonyl peak indicating the absence of a bio-based source. Modifier H is a hybrid of petroleum derivative and a bio oil. And the guy called Emil had a unique fingerprint unlike all the others. One of the reasons that the FTIR is a unique characteristic that we may in Illinois um, utilize is the impact of aging can be seen in FTIR spectra. The black line is the original unaged binder. And as the binder is progressively aged, the absorbance increases especially in the wave numbers that indicate oxidation. This increase can be used to quantify the effects of aging on modified binders. Specifically, the oxidation indices that are most relevant to the binder modification study are the carbonyl index and the sulfoxide index. If we sum the area under the peaks in the appropriate ranges and divide by the total peak area, the indices can be quantified and compared to determine the oxidation or aging of the modified binders. So the carbonyl index takes the areas under those peaks that are highlighted that have the carbon bonds. You have the carbonyls, the aromatics, the aliphatics, the alkoxy, and the aromatics. The sulfide, sulfoxide index will analyze those sulfoxide peaks from 10 to 70 to 990. The additional of, of those peaks can provide you those indices that can be used for comparison. Oxidation products increase with aging. That was shown with those increase in carbonyl, sulfoxides, and alkoxy groups previously. Petroleum-based asphalt-like modifier had a significantly higher molecular weight. However, its FTIR specter shows the presence of a bio-based um, component as well. The glycolamine modifier had the most distinct chemical functional groups compared to the other modifiers, and it is high in nitrogen, which is known to retard aging. Vegetable oil-based modifiers have similar FTIR spectra and molecular weight distribution. The fatty acid-based modifiers had similar FTIR spectra, but they had different molecular weight distribution, which gives you um, indication that they were a different molecular species, even though generically uh, classified as fatty acids. So a general summary, um, oversimplification probably of the rheological and chemical interactions is aging results in increased oxidation products, which increases brittleness. It also results in forming larger molecules. Those two uh, major pieces can be seen in all of that rheological work and chemical work. And we feel that we can use those parameters to uh, quantify the performance and effect of modifiers as they age. Next, I, I talked about the validation of this procedure and kind of determining where the aging needs to be set in relation to field core. Field cores were collected throughout Illinois. Thank you to the districts that helped participate and provide these locations. You can see we have four locations in Northern Illinois. We have four locations in Central Illinois and one in the Southern part of the state. The bulk of them were 64 minus 22. You had 158 minus 22 and 176 minus 28. The ages ranged from nine to 17 years. And you will see in the next slide that the aging um, extent varies with the AC layer depth. The cores were sliced at half inch depths and the binder extracted. The top half inch slice were considered the long-term field aged sample and will be used for characterization in the next slide. The graph compares the lab age base binder S1, a 64 minus 22, and the values here will be shown in red. The first is the unaged, the second is the RTFO aged, PAV aged, single PAV, double PAV, and three PAV. We then compared, they then compared those sample 
um, to the asphalt extracted from the cores in the field. This is the US 51, the top inch matches very closely or exceeds the aging seen at three PAV in the lab. Further down into the core at three and a half to four inches matches more closely with this double PAV at the higher frequencies. As you move further down into the core, eight and a half to nine inches, we see that that's between RTFO aged and single PAV. And then when we get to the very bottom of the core, between 12 and 12 and a half inches, you will see that it's not quite the same as the unaged binder, but not quite the same as much as RTFO aged. So this tells us a significant amount about where we should perhaps set these aging parameters for our binder. I was surprised to see how much aging we were seeing throughout the depths of this core. I expected the, um, the surface to have the amount of aging in the long-term um, high aging that we saw, but I was surprised to see even at the depths of three and a half um, and eight and a half inches, how much aging we were actually seeing at those depths. And that will be used to help determine the criteria as we move forward with how much laboratory aging we will want to use. The next graph shows the um, FTIR spectra of that extracted binder at those lifts. The purple is the furthest down. It's the, um, the number eight slice. L2 is the green as you move up towards the surface. The next line is L2 number two getting closer to the surface and the num L2 number one is the red curve and you can see at, with the arrows that the oxidation is greater and we can see those indices would be higher at that higher surface. So the more aging is at the surface of the binder but there is still some aging seen throughout. So a summary of that field aging and things we learned, uh, the field aid binder is different than laboratory age binder. None of those curves exactly matched up. Field aging varies with depth. The most equivalent to three PAV is at the top half inch. You saw minimal aging at the bottom of the 12 inch core, less than RTFO, but more than the unaged binder. And the results suggest that a single PAV is just not going to represent any realistic field aging in Illinois. So quick summary of the project, rheological and chemical tests presented distinct performances of all the modifiers, which is what we were looking for in this study. All the rheological parameters were significantly affected by aging. Two and three PAV seem to represent the best field aging. Three groups of modifiers emerged. You saw the poor performing REOB, average performers, the vegetable oils, and the good performing were the glycolamine and fatty acid derivatives. The parameters of Glover Rho and Delta C are consistent with each other and show similar trends for modified binders which ate with aging for those low temperature criteria. Delta G and the black angle provide additional vehicle loading performance data at the intermediate temperatures. As we're talking about the potential protocol and some of the things that we would kind of focus our lens on in Illinois, these are the current parameters they are kind of leading the way, and that's why I chose to present more on these criteria than all of the work that, uh, that the PIs have worked on this project and all of their team. They have done an extensive amount of work behind the scenes, but where we are now and what we are able to do in Illinois, this is probably where we're headed. These values are just proposed. They were proposed by the researcher based on the results um, thus far of this study, and you could see in the graphs. Um, so we would be looking potentially at cracking parameters of delta G for the fatigue cracking, the thermal cracking, we would look at Glover Rho, and then low temperature cracking, we would look at delta TC. For kind of the advanced rheological look, that thermal cracking, we might look at the black angle and the Glover Rho at the different temperatures. And then we're not sure exactly how we intend to look at the oxidation and disease, but we would like to use those as a determination of percent change or um, a maximum change perhaps, or some criteria that we would look at those. We need to get some of those into our own laboratories and start working on those. That's one of the next implementation pieces is that we start working to um, test some of these binders in our laboratories, have um, BK and his team maybe um, 
send us samples, we can do some work with them and they can help us um, and our staff learn how to run some of these tests and see where we would with that testing in Illinois and kind of learn that curve and figure it out so that we could then help our producers as they would work with us um, to move into the implementation um, widespread. So IDOT's goals, general goals, as were kind of mentioned before, is to implement a protocol for testing and approving these modified binders. Previous slide kind of gives you a, a cliff note, an indication of where we might be headed as a, an idea for right now. Once we would have that protocol, we would then test those approved modified binders in HMA and perform the long-term aging protocol and test for IFIT. As Jim mentioned before in his slide, that's, that's the goal. The overall goal of this program is to tie the two metrics and to be able to give the contractor um, binders with a known performance that they can use in their mixed design successfully. So we're hoping that this all dovetails together and we could work to ensure that binders that were modified appropriately and met this protocol could be used in mix and aged and perform and meet all of our goals and objectives. With that, I will take any questions you might have. Um, thank you, Kelly. We have time for one question. Go yes. ahead, Mama. Yes, thank you, Kelly, for this presentation. We have one question from Professor Hajj. Professor, I just allowed you to talk. Yeah, hi, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Great, thanks. Um, thanks for the, the really nice presentation, Kelly. This was, uh, it was really interesting and uh, good to see the huge test matrix that you all have looked at. Um, I, I have a bunch of questions, but I'll stick to one since there's not too much time. Um, the, I guess one thing I noticed is that um, the it looked like a bunch of the binders were uh, failing Delta TC um, at both the PAV and two PAV uh, criteria set by the Asphalt Institute, um, whereas they were all passing Glover Row by a huge amount. Um, like they were all way under the proposed criteria you put there of 800 uh, kilopascals, I think. And um, I was wondering, is the is there maybe some regional calibration or climate calibration that needs to be done for that parameter, um, you know, for different areas? Because in some locations, it looks like they're passing everything, everything stiffness controlled some parts of the country. And here it looks like they're mostly, a lot of them are failing Delta TC, but passing Glover Row. Absolutely, and that's a good point. Um, what we've done in the past uh, year and a half since we kind of started this project is Illinois has been our laboratory by team this chemistry lab has been testing just our base binders unmodified to see where they would would fall on the delta tc criteria and i think currently the the latest lab values that i saw about 76 percent of ours were passing the negative five at 2 pav so your point is valid and we did see that with the modifiers too so while those are starting points and that is what the asphalt in institute is basing on, we will probably have to massage those values in, a, in order to appropriately uh, characterize our binders here in Illinois, the sources we have and the ability to modify, to soften them, to get those criteria. So yes, that is a very good point. Great, thanks. Okay. Thank I, you, Kelly. And I see no more. I think we are gonna have to limit, limit the questions. So if you can just um, have people type those questions in and then we can we'll try to get the answers to to everybody that that does have a question so if you do have further questions please type them into the q a or to the chat area and we will be monitoring those and get and get answers out to everyone sure for our next presentation um, we actually have three speakers and i will introduce them all at the beginning um, but we'll be talking about workforce development um, of young professionals and how the industry plans to invest in our future. Tim Murphy is the president of Murphy Pavement Technology. Before founding Murphy Pavement Technology, he worked for IDOT, the Asphalt Institute, and Chicago Testing Lab. Murphy teaches numerous industry qualification certification courses. He is also a board certified member of the National Academy of Forensics Engineers. The next speaker will be Ryan Trafficato. He is the Materials Coordinator Manager at Trans Systems. He has de a demonstrated history of working in construction management, contract documentation, and inspection management. Ryan is key roles in infrastructure projects include the Route 30 grade separation in Linwood, 
159th Street, um, and the M7 I-90 Tollway Maintenance Facility in Rockford. He holds a bachelor's in business administration from Roosevelt University and a master's in accounting from the University of Illinois, Chicago. And our third speaker is Sonia Martinez. And she is the employee relations director for Gallagher Asphalt Companies. Sonia manages recruit, recruiting, retention, and professional development. She has nine years of experience throughout the company from trucking dispatch to executive assistance and currently human resources. She holds a SHRM um, CP certification. So Tim, I believe you're gonna kick everything off so we can see your presentation. You wanna check your audio? Everything sound good on your end, Kevin? We're hearing you good, Tim. Go ahead. All right, awesome. Thanks again for inviting me, uh, Professor Alcotti and the committee. And Kevin, thank you for the introductions. Much appreciated. Oh, we're going to go through a couple of stories and I'm very, very fortunate to have both Sonia and, and Ryan on to really tell some nice stories about their workforce development and to maybe lay down some, uh, some challenges to all of us about what we need to do to continue to invest in our future with uh, aspiring engineers and scientists, so to speak. So really the possibilities are endless. Um, most of you know, I have four daughters with my wife. They're all adults and we've really done the best we could to impart upon them the importance of STEM. And, and they're all over the spectrum um, of the STEM as well as into the arts as well. Um, so you got to follow your passion and that'll be a common theme that I think you're probably going to hear from everyone this afternoon. Um, it really is important for me to uh, give some major kudos to the Illinois Asphalt Pavement Association, in particular the membership uh, that has for many, many years been placing before many students a scholarship program that it, it's a, it's a two-way street. It's for the students to uh, learn about asphalt and it's for industry to get future asphalt scientists into our, into our line of work. You know, so promote asphalt, best, best uh, performance. You've heard from a lot of the scholarship winners today and over the years at the convention as they go on to become great leaders within Illinois DOT and uh, with contractors. Um, we want to certainly enhance the relationship with all of the engineering and construction schools. Um, you know, I'm humbled to be a consultant member of the IAPA and provide educational assistance to qualified students. They get, they get a little bit of accolades when they go to the IAPA convention every March. Uh, these are the universities and colleges that are part of the Illinois Asphalt Pavement Association Scholarship Program. And really just to highlight since 1984, it's a few years ago, uh, the association has awarded over $500,000 for 200 scholars. It's pretty impressive. It's a really good commitment um, that, that really we don't talk about enough. So to launch us into our little little workshop here this afternoon at the end of the day, I wanted to make sure I mentioned that. And certainly to give a shout out to the Illinois Department of Transportation for their continued highway construction careers training program as well. At the very end, I might talk a little bit about um, cooperative education, something near and dear to my own heart. Uh, but you know, the important part of today was to surround myself with some really passionate people. And the first person who is going to help us to continue to explore workforce development is Miss Sonia Martinez. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over to Sonia right now and uh, I'll keep quiet. Sonia. Thank you, Tim. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you all for zooming in today. Um, I am nervous and excited to be here. Uh, this is my first time ever presenting to a group professionally, so I feel uh, show some mercy. Um, I'd like to thank Tim uh, for, for the invitation to speak here today. Um, and as, as the slide says, and as he indicated, um, I am, this is something that I am passionate about. Um, and I'll share with you a little later my story of, of how I got here. Um, and I'd also like to thank the conference staff for having me. So I hope you all find this, this presentation worthwhile. Um, so first I'd like to say that I'm glad to see the conversation happening around workforce development. 
Um, it's a concern in the asphalt industry in particular, um, so much so that Napa spent 2019 kind of digging into the problem and presented their findings at the 2020 annual meeting earlier this year. Um, and one of the big takeaways was the perception of our industry. So dirty, people thought, they thought dirty, hot, gross asphalt. Um, you know, but as, as all of you know, it's not just the work in the field. There's so much behind the scenes that goes into it. Um, you know, just the presentation before here, you know, who that, that wouldn't even occur to, to the man on the street um, and, and kids going through school trying to find a career path. Um, so I, I will talk today about some things that Gallagher is doing and a couple of our success stories. Um, but I think the biggest message is that we all play a role in employee development. Um, so a short background on me, I'm the Employee Relations Director for Gallagher Asphalt. Uh, as was mentioned, the focus of my role is recruiting, retention, and development for our workforce. Uh, this is my 10th season working for Gallagher, but it's been a part of my life since I was born. So my dad started with Gallagher in 1972 and retired in 2012, 40 years. So quite a, a far cry from the average time in employees days currently. Um, the cool thing, I think, is uh, there are a lot of legacy stories like that. Um, so it is a family-owned company, but the Gallaghers are not the only family to have multiple generations in the business. Um, and to me, if you wouldn't recommend your employer to your family and friends, um, maybe they're not such a great place to work, or maybe you just don't like your family. <laughs> so a bit about Gallagher um, on the map here. Uh, we have three plants in the Chicagoland area. We have Thornton, Joliet, and Bourbon A. Uh, we're a 92-year-old family-owned asphalt paving contractor and producer. Um, we are in our third generation of leadership with the fourth generation having come on board um, all within the last two or three years. Um, and our mission is moving families forward. So that, that's why Gallagher's here. That's, what, that's why we exist. Um, and now the reason that you're all here, workforce development. So what do we do? How do we support it? And what can you do? Um, so just as all of you are, Gallagher is passionate about the industry as well. I mean, who knew there was so much to ask about? Um, and our development starts with the industry as a whole. So our, found, our founder was an industry leader from the start. So James Gallagher was the founder of Gallagher Asphalt um, and was involved with different industry associations from their inception and the services continued through the generations. Uh, the second generation of leadership um, served the industry as well. Uh, Napa, Road Builders, IAPA, um, and our current leadership, the third generation, um, Charlie, um, on, on my right, maybe your left, um, our current president, um, has served as the Road Builders President, IRTBA, um, as well as served on the board. Uh, and Dan in the center there is past chairman and board member for NAPA, IAPA, and NCAT. So our employees in fourth generation, um, Gallagher's, we, we ask them to participate and get involved um, with the different industry organizations uh, and committees as well. Um, so we feel that being involved in your work through service uh, and having a full understanding of the industry can help us better understand the industry um, and be agile as the industry changes and in some cases be the one to lead the change. Um, and speaking of change, innovation is in our blood, so to speak. Um, in 1928, James Gallagher, a man with a fifth grade education and a drive to do things better, started Gallagher Asphalt. Um, and in 1933, just five years later, applied for and received a patent for his invention, apparatus for spreading hot asphalt. So it was a coil system, as you can see in the center picture there, um, that was heated with hot liquid to keep the asphalt from sticking as it passed through the street and was laid. Um, and currently, keeping with that innovative spirit, we have an operations engineer uh, who has two patent applications under review. Uh, the first one is for a device to modify the conventional paving screen. And the second is a new paving process that's intended to solve the issue of lower pavement density 
that you find when paving over recessed areas such as scabs and wheel ruts, um, because this is where roller bridging is likely to occur. Um, so as a company, we're always looking for a better way and we encourage our folks to lead the way. Um, we've worked directly with IDOT on e-ticketing, piloted various, excuse me, various telematics on our equipment. Um, and in-house, we're developing a custom scheduling program that integrates with our trucking dispatch, our labor scheduling, workforce skills, quality control, and plant operations. So something um, all-encompassing that has all the information for everyone in one place. Each of these improvements allows the company to better serve the families they support and the customers that they serve. Um, so right now, I'd ask you to kind of pause and think about um, why you became an engineer or why you chose the profession that you did related to the industry. So was it to create or design, uh, innovate or explore? Uh, if the answer is yes to any one of these, I encourage you to find more ways to pursue these avenues in your work. So it's you folks at this conference that are digging into the details and getting involved that are going to be the change makers in the industry. Um, <clears throat> so as the slide here says, apprenticeships are not only valuable for our young people, they are a key way for all employers to invest in their workforce and provide the skills and economy needs, both the economy needs both now and in the future. Um, so what we understand and what we believe is that it's the people that make these innovations happen. So we're dedicated to training and developing our workforce and everyone that passes through our doors. So everyone that comes here has some sort of experience um, or is, is educated a little bit about what we do and how we contribute. Um, one of the things that we do is each October for Manufacturing Day, we bring in a high school students from a couple different schools, uh, introduce them to our plant and quality control operations. We also have a 12 week summer intern program in our construction, project management and plants divisions of the organization. And our field and office employees are regularly trained in safety, best practices, equipment and leadership. For current employees, we also have an opportunity for them to learn about other positions within the company. So our program is called WIMS. It stands for walking in my shoes um, and Employees have the opportunity to spend time with any position in the company that they're interested in. So similar to a job shadow. Um, but there are some, some specific criteria. So you need to define your learning objectives and what it is specifically that you want to know and how it's going to add value to either your role or their role. Um, and then you come up with a plan with your manager uh, and schedule the time. Sometimes it's just a couple hours. Sometimes it's it's a few hours a day, you know, over the course of a week uh, or maybe a month, depending on, on what the learning, learning objective is. Um, but at Gallagher, our vision statement serves as a reminder for us um, is why, as to why this training is so important. Uh, our vision statement uh, challenges us to reach the level of nationally recognized industry leader in safety, quality, and innovation and it states that the company is dedicated to bring, being a great place to work by continually engaging and inspiring our team to reach their maximum potential. So ideally, workforce development, wherever you're at, encourages all employees to reach their potential. Apprenticeships and interest, internships are a great way to introduce new talent to the industry. For us, our internships allow potential employees to get a taste for what the industry and work is and helps them tailor their education to their desires. Um, when we hire new employees with no prior experience, we like to take an apprenticeship approach, uh, similar to what the unions do with their skilled labor force. Um, although we're still developing a formal program informally, our new hires are encouraged to ask questions of everyone they cross paths with. Um, so whether it's accounting, project management, billing, uh, plants, any anybody that you that you cross paths with, please, please ask a question. Um, and our more experienced staff are encouraged to teach and share what they know. Um, I think that both parties benefit when presented with a different approach to an old or a new task. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, we can all play a role. So regardless of our experience, 
whether you're just starting in the industry or you've got 40 years in and are ready to exit. Um, but if you think back when you were in, in school and college um, and even back to high school, trying to decide what you wanted to pursue in college, uh, the career choices you were presented with were probably pretty vague and broad and you picked something and just because you had to, you figured, oh yeah, I like this. Um, but as you went through college and did a few internships and met more people, your horizons broadened and you became aware of the detail that all of those larger categories had. Um, and this is where you come in. So share what you've learned about all the different work opportunities with everyone you know. All the young people in your life, all the people that are going through school, if you're an instructor, um, you know, just get sharing, sharing what you know. Um, you know, there's, there's a meme out there, the more you know, <laughs> and it's, it's true. Um, so you can never tell what will spark someone's interest. There's a saying that no single conversation is guaranteed to change a situation or change someone's mind. But the fact is that a single conversation can, it's that powerful. And you never know what or when that will be. So please, please talk, talk to each other. Um, so now a couple of examples at Gallagher, um, some success stories, if you will. Um, so the first one is about our newest project superintendent um, and his name is Baylor. Um, and Baylor interned at Gallagher during his junior year of college while he was pursuing a finance degree, um, which isn't typically an area of study that we recruit from. Um, but he had a sincere interest and, and we said, come on board. Um, so a year after graduation, he decided to pursue um, something closely, more closely related to, to his major. Um, but after a year, he returned to Gallagher um, and started here as a project engineer. So for that, it's typically an office position. So they work um, with the estimators um, and kind of on the pre-construction side of the projects. Um, but being Baylor, he's very curious. Um, he sought out ways to work in the field, learning about construction site operations. Um, and with his finance background, um, we recruited him to work on a data analytics project for the company. Um, so both of these were interests of his that were outside of his job description. Um, but through this exploration, he realized his passion was working in the field and has made the transfer to the project superintendent, um, supervising the construction um, of the projects that our, that our project management team wins. So, uh, he's cur currently pursuing the Transportation Engineering Online Certification from U of I. Um, and again, continuing education as part of the development um, and it's fully supported by, by Gallagher. Um, and it's key um, to keeping up with best practices uh, and even attending conferences like this. And, you know, this is, this is why we're here to learn. Um, a more personal example is my own story. So most of my experience before I came to Gallagher was as an administrative assistant. Um, and I was having, before I came here, I was having trouble finding work after staying home with two young kids as my husband and I started a family. So after being out of the game for five years, uh, Gallagher took a chance and I was hired on as the truck dispatcher and completed a season. Um, when I was called back the next season, I was offered the position of executive assistant and I was so excited to be back in my comfort zone. Um, and in that role, I was able to really dig in and see what the whole operation was about. I asked questions, got out to the field to meet our laborers and operators. I visited job sites, plants, and moved through the office learning what our team members liked and what they didn't like about Gallagher. Um, and the Gallagher's are, were always open to hearing, hearing the feedback. Um, after a few years, in an employee survey, the Gallagher's asked uh, one of the things, what should they be planning for? What should they be uh, looking at on the horizon? Um, and for better or worse, depending on the day that I'm having, I voiced the opinion that they should be planning for a more defined HR department. So until then, HR was kind of handled by our financial analyst um, and service, so to speak, getting questions answered, where do I find this, how do we do this? Um, it, was, it was a little limited, um, and it seemed like we were hiring people left and right. Um, so, and more and more as we were hiring those people, and, and she had her duties to attend to, 
um, onboarding seemed to become part of my role as the executive assistant and more and more people were coming to me asking, how do I do this? Um, and luckily I had the answers because I was able to ask questions and get out there and, and I knew. Um, so the, the next season, um, after a couple seasons, I should say, um, in the executive assistant role, I was offered the newly created position of employee relations manager. Um, so again, managing the recruiting, retention, and development of our workforce. Um, since this position started, we've introduced formal leadership training, the structured performance review and bonus program, employee newsletter, employee engagement survey, and we've brought back the annual Christmas party. So while I can't take credit for all of these ideas, I am the administrator for them, and they are significant ways that Gallagher shows appreciation for their team members. Personally, I've always seen myself as a cheerleader or a coach, and I now I'm able to do this every day in meaningful ways for an awesome group of people. I am officially that guy, the one that exclaims I love my job when anyone asks if I like what I do. Um, in mine and Baylor's example, Gallagher allowed us to get creative with our positions and push the boundaries a little bit to see what we liked and to find out how we could best serve the company too. Um, I also want to communicate that mine and Baylor's stories are the result of us taking ownership of our roles and working to our strengths. So not knowing what opportunities were available to him, Baylor had the courage to share with us what he envisioned for, his, for himself and challenged us um, in the organization to think differently about his role. Um, in my case, to be honest, at the beginning, I was miserable as a dispatcher. Um, I remember coming home crying day after day, <laughs> wishing I could find another job. Um, until one day, a single and short conversation with a friend of mine changed my entire outlook. Um, he said, stop crying about it and find a way to make it your own. You don't have to do it the way that somebody else did. Um, and I can't tell you how eye-opening this was. So once I took ownership of my work, I began to enjoy it. It wasn't a dream job, but it put me in a good place to perform and create another opportunity. So it's all well and good for employers to invest in their workforce, but as an individual, when we take ownership of our career and what we want, it can help us rise to the top. Workforce development is more than training. Purpose, service, and passion. So understanding why you enjoy the role you're in or the work that you do and how it benefits others will help you continually hone your craft and develop your skills. An outward focus encourages creative thinking and a dedication to improvement. Finding a company that will invest in their people and the community, believing that it's better to train someone and risk losing them than not training at all benefits everyone. And passion. When you have excitement for what you do and have a purpose for your work, you are happier and more effective. As you leave today's session, I encourage you to take ownership of your career and to find a new avenue to explore or a new opportunity to develop your skills. Start by thinking about what you've learned or who you've met at this conference and put it to work for you. So thank you all for your time. And if you have any questions, I look forward to answering them at the end of our session. Uh, here's my contact information on the screen if anything comes up later or you're looking for ways to implement a development program for your team or organization, or again, any questions at all. So thank you all very much. Thank you very much, Sonia. Appreciate your time. Uh, next up is, is Ryan. Ryan, why don't you tell us about yourself? Um, audio okay? You sound great. All right, uh, so, all right, thanks, Tim. Tim asked me to briefly share my career story thus far, so I'll just go ahead and jump in. Uh, my path begins with me dropping out of art college, taking a backbreaking job loading trucks at Sears Warehouse. Uh, one summer of that, and I was immediately looking for something else, when a friend of mine handed me an application for being a materials tester at TSC in Tinley Park. I had zero clue what that was, but they were paying a whopping wage of $8.50 an hour, so I jumped on it. Uh, this is well before testers were unionized, um, at the time, I figured it was something to bridge a gap until I figured out what I actually wanted to do. Uh, so TSC set me up with a slump cone and a Troxler 3401 new gauge from 1958. Uh, I went out, tested concrete for uh, commercial buildings and asphalt for parking lots. Pretty menial, but honestly, it was a great place to start. 
Uh, we got all of our friends jobs there. And at one point in time, the entire roster of TSC Tinley Park consisted of literally just my immediate friend group and I. Uh, two years later, I took a job with JFG in Thornton, which basically became CTL. Uh, CTL, I learned everything there was to know about asphalt and road construction with, with regard to asphalt. Uh, I spent a lot of time in Schaumburg IDOT lab, splitting hot mix samples for Paul Welch, and at one point running nine sets of voids in an eight hour shift every single day. I learned a lot about QCQA and the PFP programs, lots of tollway and interstate QC duties for Gallagher, as well as consulting for city asphalt suppliers and road crews like Begain and Metromax. In 2010, I got to be a part of the beginnings of the independent assurance program for IDOT. Um, <clears throat> over my tenure at CTL, I did my fair share of hauling wheelbarrows for, of concrete around for 14 hour long deck cores. I worked many 24 hour shifts and weekends. I spent some time in other cities for months on end working nights doing density on tollway projects. I took every IDOT certification class. Oh, that's uh, Syed. I worked with him at TSC in 1999. <laughs> I think he's still at MSL, if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, at CTO, we even taught most of uh, the IDOT classes. I spent a few winters with Paul Yerkes proctoring ACI uh, grade one field testing, watching people botch the rollometer section over and over. After holding out a bit, we finally went union, and then I was offered a chance to take the ICC courses through Local 150 with my friend and fellow CTL employee, Machek. Classes like blueprint reading, masonry, bolting, and fireproofing. In my line of work, which for years was strictly infrastructure, none of these certs were anything I could typically use. Um, I liked the idea of adding them to my resume. Truthfully, I found spending weeks at a time surrounded by others in the industry, I began to build relationships through the classes. Uh, so when I say that, I don't mean just getting like a business card from someone. What I mean is actually reinforcing the connection, offering to meet up with a colleague for lunch or for a beer, or joining a coworker to play on their really bad kickball team. For me, it's always been uh, sort of a win-win for both parties. Um, both sides build relationships on a social level as well as a professional level. Uh, it's a good resource to have when you begin to build trust and these are individuals you can bounce questions off of that you, you may feel silly asking your boss about. Uh, so no matter where I've worked, there are courses I've taken and conferences I've attended that an employer didn't pay for or even mention. Uh, I've never cared, I just always looked at the net benefit. That's Tommy Buckmaster. Uh, I think that's Thornton, Gallagher Thornton, I'm pretty sure. Sure. Uh, I took IDOT documentation as the only QC tester in the entire class. At that time, I had no idea what they were talking about in the class, but I figured it out and I completed it. At a certain point while I was at CTL, around age 23, I decided to go back to college. Through the seasonal nature of our industry, I was able to figure out ways to complete all my coursework, either in the winter months, online, or at night. My boss at the time was very patient and very flexible during, during that era. I remember, for example, running a nuke, cutting cores on a job, leaving to go to a night course downtown, and then coming back later that same night to run cores in the lab all alone. I did this sort of thing all the way through my, my entire college tenure from prereqs through um, my master's. Uh, after a long time at CTL, it was finally time to move up. So I took a job as QC manager with McHugh Construction. There I was able to work with my friend Machek. At McHugh, I got a feel for managing materials from the contractor side on projects um, like a pretty substantial grade separation project in Linwood and 35th Street Pedestrian Bridge. I learned hands-on plan reading <clears throat> and I met a lot of new people. Actually something I picked up there, and I don't know who needs to hear this, but I made a spreadsheet of names and job titles as well as industry acronyms. So I wouldn't have to ask the same question <laughs> more than once. Uh, basically, I learned a whole new textbook of industry terminology. At the time, I just nodded a lot. I secretly Googled the definitions, and I kept my inquiries limited to necessary questions that way. I took the Certified Welding Inspector course with certifiably zero intention of wanting to actually inspect welds. I took it to get exposure to the processes and different types of welding inspection. For anyone who has taken CWI, you know it's pretty grueling, comprehensive course. 
which the exam took me three months to prepare for. I took CWI so I could uh, be able to speak the language. I've used it in terms of hiring CWIs to come to my project sites, uh, being able to communicate with them what I need, as well as uh, interpret drawings and inspection reports. <clears throat> Excuse me. I wasn't at McHugh for very long before I realized I found myself identifying infinitely more with the guys on the engineering and inspection side of things. So inevitably I made the jump to the other side. I left 150. Oh, some of these cityscape shots are taken by Vic Buendia. He's a, uh, he does uh, admin stuff for Anshu at uh, Intera. I think he's a really good photographer. Um, okay, so, okay. I left 150 and I went to Ardmore. So Ardmore placed me for a year and a half on CTR joint venture, which was consulting for city of Chicago, department of water management for water main restoration inspection. I was able to learn a lot about estimating paying for line items, agreeing or disagreeing with contractors on quantities placed. I learned more than I ever wanted to know about building ADA ramps and percent pitch. The next year and a half with Ardmore, I was on M7, a maintenance facility in Rockford. I drove to and from Rockford every day from Humboldt Park for that, but I didn't mind. It was my first gig as materials coordinator and it was a lot to learn in that capacity. I got very familiar with ticket tape and precast concrete. Uh, I was able to finally dig down and use my knowledge of welding, masonry, and floor slab concrete mixes. Uh, right about when M7 wrapped up, my friend Mike Boyle, who was acting materials coordinator for Stanley Consultants, let me know he was leaving his role. He put a word in for me, and I came aboard with Stanley. I took over as MC on the infamous 159th Street project in Homer Glen. Uh, I learned a lot on that project in terms of, well, what could go wrong which is an entire education system in its own right. Uh, I learned a lot about IDRs, RFAs, and the QCP program. I'd say most importantly, I figured out a lot in terms of decision-making and developing personal philosophies with regard to management. Uh, people have commented on how I've jumped around to <clears throat> different companies over the last six or seven years. I do agree it looks weird on a resume, and I don't even specifically recommend it. But the truth is I've been ushered around by, Sam, by Adam Smith's invisible hand. Uh, the point is there's always been a balance I've tried to establish between taking the best offer and finding the best fit. So the other truth is personally, I feel I found the greatest balance now in working with trans systems. Uh, I enjoy it. Plus I get to work with my friend Machek. Uh, Trans systems, I've been a, uh, doing a lot of estimating QA costs for city projects, as well as budgeting and cost allocation. It's great because I live in Chicago, so not only am I playing a role in preserving roads, um, I'm proud to get a, to play a role in preserving roads and bridges that I use on a daily basis. Plus, I'm finally getting to use my degree, which is in accounting, and I still get to use my background in materials in various ways. For example, I'll be acting point person for materials inspection on the Lincoln Yards project, uh, beginning next year. So that's that's where I'm at and I look forward to developing my role with train systems as well as working relationships on building. Uh, I'm excited to see what new challenges arise and uh, where the road leads. And I apologize for that pun, that road pun. Uh, that's all I've got. Oh, there's more. Excellent. <laughs> yeah, some really nice photos. I took I took most of those. <laughs> Good. We look forward to going back to Navy Pier next year, right, Ryan? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. So good luck on the Lincoln Yards. It sounds like an excellent opportunity for you to be involved with. Oh, yeah. For thank sure. you for, yeah, really, thank you for taking time to present your story from beginning to where you're currently at. Sounds like you've got a wonderful trajectory going, Ryan. Keep up the good work. Thanks. Really, really happy that you could take time from your busy schedule to participate in today's convention as well. Oh, thanks thank, for asking. Thank you. Uh, so the last kind of person to talk a little bit is myself. Um, I actually got lucky. I went to night school and graduated from the Illinois Institute of Technology, but I was a cooperative education student all those years back with the Illinois Department of Transportation. So my first big boy job was with IDOT, it was wonderful. 
Um, with IIT offering night schools, I could work during the day and it would go back and forth where you would do a semester of work, do a semester of school. And it really just, just was excellent. My whole career path is built on my time at the Illinois Department of Transportation. Subsequent to that, they allowed me to take uh, graduate level classes, uh, believe it or not, during work hours way back when, the good old days. Um, and you could get, I think it was four hours a week to actually go to school, but you know they were investing in your future. Um, and that's many decades ago. So I'm the oldest of this group by far. Um, really was, really was lucky to have my job at the department. And then today, as as I would say, a, a fair number of people on this convention today are what we would call baby boomers. We probably have a few silent gens on the convention. My mother is a GI generation. Uh, she turned 93 uh, uh, about a week ago. Um, banging along during this pandemic and whatnot, but different ways of how you deal with people and how we, uh, those who are, who are in the twilight of our career, have to continue to work with, mentor, as Sonia pointed out, find passion, as Ryan has pointed out, to you know, embrace and engage Gen Z, Gen Y, and Gen Xers, and how they communicate and how we get them into our business. It's our challenge. It's our goal to be successful with it, and we have to work hard. So some options and opportunities is, again, to continue to reach out to people. And I, and I want to pause for a second. I really want to say reach out to all people of every race, color, and creed, period. I'm born and raised in Chicago. I'm a product of the Chicago public school system. Um, we absolutely have to... Uh, work with and build within the inner city and, and communities to reach out to every single individual in the state of Illinois. Just because we're humans, we should do it, but that incredibly improve our, our system. And that, that's exactly what IAPA does. That's exactly what the future Farmers of America does in Indiana. And us as, as owners of businesses need to continue to go to job fairs at high schools, junior colleges, colleges, and university to explain diversity, to explain upward mobility opportunities that exist for a long, successful career in our business. And they're good paying jobs. They're indoors, they're outdoors, engineers, technicians, whatever, you name it, we got it for you. It's our job though, at, at this point in our career, to be the ones who do that, all right? So please double down and make a commitment to continue to do this again to broaden our horizons to continue to expose every race color and creed into our industry uh, as far as future education opportunities uh, we kind of know there's a lot of stuff online right now unfortunately some some trade shows have been canceled they're going online world of asphalt you can probably watch me on a video at that Lots of agency asphalt training programs. Uh, Jim Trepanier talked about the process for Illinois for the upcoming year or so. Uh, asphalt Institute, you got Wild Bill who, who uh, did a real nice job getting an award today uh, for presenting the Bailey Method. I'm certain he'll be doing it again this, this year. These are, these are things that we need to continue to expose the future workforce to all of these items so that they become familiar with our equipment and the way we do business. And it never ends other than the National Center for Asphalt Technology has a professor's training course, which is an excellent online course to go to. An Asphalt Pro, more nuts and bolts, paver equipment. At Nair has got some wonderful training, Road Tech. All of these different manufacturers have excellent things that certainly they promote their product, but they also promote processes and and how we do business. Um, one of the quotes I got today from a good friend of mine, Bill Pine, was knowledge and experience isn't nearly as important as the want to. Want to work, want to learn, want to contribute. You can't teach, want to. And, you know, better words were not spoken specific to workforce development than these. And, and I, I got this out of some texting with Pine this morning. And again, congratulations on an incredibly well-deserved award, William.
proud to call you a friend. And then put me in coach. Paul Yerkes polls went off and the history of Paul and me is that I was his fifth grade basketball coach. He was a skinny little rail soaking wet. He couldn't have weighed 60 pounds, but he was on the bench and he looked at me and he said, Hey, put me in coach. And he was ready. He, you know, as the song goes, he was ready to play. His upward trajectory has been phenomenal. He's vice president of Chicago testing lab. Now, uh, incredibly wonderful family. I've been blessed to know him for, uh, many, many years, probably, probably about 30 or 40 more options and opportunities. The Illinois Department of Commerce has uh, their Illinois WorkNet Center. And, and I really got to uh, suggest you all spend time on the website. These are wonderful programs and services that are built to, to help continue to train and diversify and, and build on our build on our skilled workforce, all right? It's, it's our job to do this. And you know, the hell with the pandemic, there's gonna be money to continue this road program forward, plain and simple. We have to do it and we will do it. And we're gonna be incredibly successful at doing it. And that's kind of our story that we really wanted to share with you today with regards to workforce development I really do want to thank all of the sponsors and the exhibitors for today and for tomorrow's convention. Again, I want to thank all of the um, all of the folks on the committee that asked for Sonia and Ryan and I to, you know, give you give you a little bit of take on workforce development, lay some more challenges of how we continue to be successful in our business. Uh, mentoring is is a common theme have passion is a common theme and diversification is going to continue to be a common theme well into the future. So those are going to be the challenges I lay for you today. We do look forward to seeing you face to face and shaking your hands as uh, the Federal Highway Administration suggested today. I do look forward to seeing everybody in 2021. Also look forward to seeing everybody tomorrow virtually. So if there's time for a question or two, all of the panelists are still available. Um, and I'll turn it over to Noel. Thank you, everyone. Mama, do we have any questions? We've got time. Yes, I think we have two small questions in the chat, if you could answer them very quickly. So one question is, with diversity being a big issue in our society, what ways are your firms incorporating a diversity element into retaining and encouraging younger engineers and technicians to continuing in this industry? I'll let Sonia and Ryan handle that question. They work with large organizations. So, yeah, this, this is Sonia. Um, so for Gallagher specifically, um, in reaching, so on manufacturing day, the high schools that we serve um, might be considered underprivileged um, or have uh, a higher population of people of color. Um, we work with, um, oh gosh, Bloom Trail um, is, comes to see us every year. Um, and there's, there's a couple schools here in the South Suburbs. Um, the South Suburban um, Economic Development uh, group has a internship program um, that we've participated in um, recruiting people uh, to bring them in for 12 week programs just to kind of introduce them into uh, the industry. Um, and then on college campuses this year, um, you know, our focus, so spring recruiting is kind of starting now. Um, and our focus is going to be to get in with the individual um, groups. So I know that a lot of the, a lot of the campuses have groups um, aligned specifically for um, different populations within the engineering schools. Um, so we'll be reaching out in those ways. And what advice would you give to students in high school to attract them to this industry? What do you think, Ryan? Well, you wanna jump on that one? Yeah, when I was in high school, I wish somebody would have told me about the high, <laughs> relatively high wages, um, relative autonomy, and working outdoors. 
Good sales pitch. We, we're, we better get you into some high schools doing this, Ryan. <laughs> yeah. Right. I'll talk to Tony on your behalf. Okay, thanks. <laughs> okay. Similar out, outreach is, is done with a lot of folks. We, we really do have to continue to do that. Those are excellent, excellent questions. That's it, Kevin. All right, thank you, Mama. And Tim, thank you very much. Ryan, Sonia, thank you very much as well. And I, I think what it shows is how great, what I've always said about the Illinois Asphalt um, Pavement Association and our members is that like Gallagher, like a lot of the consulting firms, it is a network of people that are there to support their employees. They're family owned and operated. They've been there for generations. Um, and it's not just the owners, um, as Sonia mentioned, it is the generation of employees as well. And I think that's that's something that that is unique, somewhat unique to Illinois. And I think it's what makes our industry so great. So I think that's a, this is a perfect ending to today's session. Um, and again, to, to just to point to Tim's some of Tim's comments. Also, there are plenty of opportunities um, for students to to work with our industry, either in applying for scholarships or getting internships. Um, our, our members are always looking for that next generation to make our industry better. Um, and we will continue to, that effort as, as far as recruiting and, and bringing people into, into our workforce. Um, again, I'd like to thank all, all the sponsors for the Bituminous Paving Conference. Um, Dr. Alcada, are you, um, we'd like to say anything before we wrap up. Mod? Sorry, that was muted. There, there you are. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you so much. And I definitely wanted to recognize uh, Kevin uh, Ayapa's uh, support for the students to direct them into this industry with the scholarship that you are providing uh, to the various schools here. Um, again, thank you, thanks Kevin. for all the speakers today and the moderators. And congratulations to the winners. And we look forward to see you tomorrow at 10 o'clock. All right. Have a great evening. Good evening.